Hello, everyone. Welcome to Novel Ideas. I'm Candace Huber, your host and the owner of Tubby & Coo's Mid-City Bookshop in New Orleans. Novel Ideas is all about what I do best, books and board games. I bring you news, discussions, interviews, and more every month. And most importantly, I make your TBR and or gaming list that much longer. This month, I'll catch you up on book industry news, tell you about my favorite books from 2017, discuss our book of the month, and bring you an engaging interview with Bill Lofelm, author of the Maureen Coughlin series. Grab a cup of your favorite beverage, pull up a chair, and let's chat. So it is Mardi Gras season in New Orleans, and everyone's partying and eating king cakes and going to parades, and I'm that grumpy old person that, like, really hates Mardi Gras and stays in my house, and I'd rather be reading, and there's a parade that passes right in front of my bookstore, so I always have to deal with it every year, and I just really don't enjoy dealing with it, but it is Mardi Gras season here, so hopefully... All of you are enjoying it. And when we talk to Bill Lofelm later on in the podcast, his book takes place during a Mardi Gras parade. So we'll be talking about that as well. But happy Mardi Gras to those of you out there who are in New Orleans and who aren't. Hopefully you can at least maybe have some king cake wherever you are. So let's start with some book industry news. So uh, unfortunately, one of my favorite authors, Ursula Le Guin, passed away recently. She was 88 she passed away in her home in Portland. They said that they're not really sure what happened. They didn't specify a cause, but her son had said that she had been in poor health for several months. And in case you don't know who Ursula Le Guin is, she was an author of a very proclaimed author of fantasy books and science fiction. And her books had really a depth and feminist sensibility to them. And she wrote, probably her famous book is The Left Hand of Darkness. And that book really changed the way people think about gender. And it came out in the 60s. And it was really, you know, she was a trailblazer as far as science fiction and fantasy goes. She also wrote the Earth Sea series, which, which is something that a lot of people may know of. But RIP Ursula Le Guin, that was really upsetting news. Also, there is a possible release date for Winds of Winter, which is the next Game of Thrones book. So this was a really interesting story. It came out, so The Strand, which is a bookstore in New York City, and it's a really big, famous bookstore, they apparently inadvertently linked leaked the release date. Um, but I don't think, I mean, I'm a bookstore owner. I haven't seen anything about Winds of Winter, really. But apparently in a blog post on Medium, the Strand Bookstore compiled a list of the most popular books that fans can look forward to this year. And among the honorable mentions in that story, in that article, was Winds of Winter, which is the next book in A Song of Ice and Fire series by George R. R. Martin, which is what the TV show Game of Thrones is based on. And so the blog post has been altered since then and that taken out. But before, someone took, of course, a screenshot of it and a note of the date. And there was a thread on Reddit about it. And everybody's giving all of their theories. Apparently, the release date was leaked or stated in that article originally as September 6th. And then they came back and removed that afterwards. Um, and George R. R. Martin has not announced anything yet. And he has said that he'll announce it first on his blog before it goes out anywhere else. So I don't really know what happened. It seems like a lot of people don't really know what happened. My personal theory is that the next book isn't going to come out until the show is over because they're going to try and ride that horse <laughs> as far as they can ride it. And they're doing really well with the show right now. It's making a lot of money. And so I think he's going to, my theory is that he's going to wait until after the show is over and then he'll release the book to keep going with it. Whereas if he releases it now, there's already a lot of hype. So I don't know. That's my theory is that when the show is over, they're going to release the next book. But who knows? That was kind of a weird thing that happened. There is no official release date yet, though, for The Winds of Winter. Also, Hocus Pocus, which is one of my like favorite movies ever. It's a Disney movie with the witches and Halloween and Bette Midler and Sarah Jessica Parker. And apparently it is getting a book sequel. So I am very excited about this news. I am a Hocus Pocus fan. There are a lot of Hocus Pocus fans. It is a cult classic since its release in 1993. 
And uh, it's about the Sanderson sisters and their, you know, mischief making ways. They're trying to live forever. And it is getting a sequel via Oh My Disney uh, posted that Hocus Pocus and the all new sequel by A.W. Jantha will jump forward 25 years after the events of the movie to visit with Max Dennison and his wife Allison. They got hitched, they got married, and their 17 year old daughter Poppy, which they're still in Salem, and Poppy gets to meet and fight, of course the Sanderson sisters. So I'm really excited about this book. I don't know exactly. I don't know if there's a release date for it. Um, They just announced that it was going to happen. I think that it's going to come out this summer. July 10th is the supposed release date for it, just in time for the film's 25th anniversary. So Hocus Pocus fans out there really get excited because this is happening. And finally, the last piece of news that I wanted to share is that The Last Jedi novelization, which is coming out soon this month, will include Han Solo's funeral, which is something that we didn't get to see on screen. So in The Last Jedi, which hit theaters in December... um, The novelization of that movie by Jason Fry is coming in March. And they always adapt basically the movie into a novel, which is the opposite of where they wouldn't do, but it always includes material that doesn't fit into the film. And so part of that material is a funeral for Han Solo, which we didn't get to see on screen. And I don't know that I'm emotionally ready for it, but it will apparently be featured in the book and also plans to explore more of Canto Bright And there's going to be a scene with Rose and Paige together, who are the sisters. And it's just going to go deeper in general into the movie. So I'm really excited. No spoilers for The Last Jedi in case you haven't seen it. But the Han Solo funeral scene is going to be really exciting. So I'm excited about all of this news except for Ursula Le Guin. Obviously, that's not exciting. But get details and links to all the news that I discussed today on our website, www.tubbyandcoos.com. Slash blog. So if you know me at all, you know that one of my favorite things to talk about is books. Obviously, I have this podcast. I own a bookstore. I've been told I'm very animated and passionate when discussing books, and that's because I just love them so much. I love everything about books. Books are amazing. And so I thought that one of the in the first podcast of 2018, I would tell you about all of my favorite books from 2017. So in no particular order, I'm going to list the 10 best books that I have read in 2017. And it was a little bit of a tumultuous year in some ways, and what I read truly reflected that as well. And I read mostly books written by people of color and women and transgender people, and it was a great year of reading. So in no particular order, my favorite books of 2017... The Princess Saves Herself in This One by Amanda Loveless. This is a powerful collection of poetry where Loveless explores herself and grief, power, love, loss, surviving, and everything in between. It's about how it's okay to not be okay and about how we all have times where we're the damsel in distress. But when we are, it's up to us to save ourselves. For a 30-minute read, it's really quick. It's a poetry collection. It really, truly packs a punch, and I highly recommend it. Next on the list is Black Panther World of Wakanda by Roxane Gay and ta Coates. If you haven't read the Black Panther comic written by ta Coates, that run, the most recent run, do yourself a favor and pick it up. This is a spinoff, World of Wakanda is a spinoff focusing on the Dora Milaje, which is the all-woman force that guards Chala, the Black Panther and ruler of Wakanda, a comic with a cast of all people of color, majority women, queer people. It's amazing, and I definitely recommend you picking it up and reading it. If you like Black Panther, obviously the movie's about to come out, so everyone's in Black Panther craze mode. I highly suggest World of Wakanda. Next is Between the World and Me by ta Coates. This book was really huge when it came out in 2015, so I thought it was about time for me to read it. Coates will help you understand the American black male experience so much more, and it gave insights into an experience that was wholly different from mine as a white woman. We recommend reading it alongside Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail, and it will really give you a powerful punch in the gut. That is Ta-Nehisi Coates' Between the World and Me. 
Next on the list is Love is Love, edited by Sarah Gatos and Jamie S. Rich. This comic anthology honoring and benefiting the survivors of the Orlando Pulse shooting made me laugh, cry, and really know that I'm not alone. One page will rip your heart out and the next will put you back together again. This collection will take you through the ringer and in the end, it will really give you hope. That is Love is Love, the comic anthology edited by Sarah Gatos and Jamie S. Rich. Next is The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas, another really huge book. And I was actually lucky enough to be able to interview Angie Thomas on this podcast. So if you go to our podcast site and look it up, we did have an interview with Angie Thomas. And that was right before this book blew up. And she was so amazing. The Hate You Give has spent 46 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list and for good reason. It gives a huge dose of black life teaches what it means to be an activist, and inspires hope that the next generation will do so much better. Next is The Book of Unknown Americans by Christina Henriquez. This is another older book that I read for the first time this year, and it's still extremely relevant. Henriquez examines immigrant life through the experiences of the people living in an apartment complex up in the northeast of the United States, and the book really gives you a better understanding of what it might be like to struggle as an immigrant and what it truly means to be American. This book is really good. It's really short. It won't take you long to read, and it will really change your perspective. That is the book of Unknown Americans by Christina Henriquez. Next up is The Stone Sky by N.K. Jemisin. This is the final book of the Broken Earth trilogy, which is one of my favorites of all time. Jemisin is a master world builder, and the social justice overtones of this story are really undeniable. The entire trilogy will keep you engaged and wanting to spend a lot more time in Jemisin's world of the stillness. The Stone Sky is really good. The whole trilogy is really good. That is the Broken Earth trilogy by N.K. Jemisin. Definitely go out and read it. Next up is The Long Way Down by Jason Reynolds. Reynolds writes this story in prose, which makes it a really, really quick read. The premise is what originally attracted me. The entire book takes place over 60 seconds in an elevator where a teenage boy is on his way to avenge his brother and is visited by ghosts of his past. This intriguing book will make you think and question your own decisions while giving you a big dose of reality. Another quick read that will completely change the way that you think about the world. Norse Mythology by Neil Gaiman. Of course, I couldn't get through a list without a Gaiman book on it. I love Neil Gaiman, as you all know if you've listened to this podcast before. Norse Mythology is basically Grimm's fairy tales for fans of Thor, Loki, and Odin. The short story format makes it an easy book to put down and pick up again, and the familiarity of the Norse gods in mainstream pop culture today makes it really relatable. It's just a fun romp with some of your favorite characters while at the same time giving you a little bit of a dose of culture. So Norse mythology, the paperback's coming out really soon. I highly suggest reading that one as well. And finally, the last on the list, but not least, is All the Birds in the Sky by Charlie Jane Anders. And I saved the best for last because All the Birds in the Sky is easily my favorite book that I read last year. It weaves together the stories of two people who are friends as children and then meet again as adults, one who is on the side of science and one who is on the side of magic. I pulled more life lessons and quotes from this book than from any other, and although it's short, it packs so much of a punch that every so often you'll have to put it down just to ponder life. If you read no other book on this list, you have to read this one, and the most exciting part is that it's a debut novel, so I really hope to see so much more from Charlie Jane Anders. She does have a short story book called Six Months, Three Days, Five Others that I will also talk about, but this is such a great book. All the birds in the sky go out and read it. And speaking of great books, our next segment is our book of the month. Each month, I'll introduce you to one of my picks and announce the book for the next month so you can read along if you so choose. This month's pick is one that I just talked about, Six Months, Three Days, Five Others by Charlie Jane Anders. As you just heard in my Best Books of 2017 segment, Charlie Jane Anders wrote my favorite book that I read last year. So, of course, I had to read this short story collection as well when it came out. The title is pretty clever. Six Months, Three Days is the title of one of the stories in the book, and there are five other stories as well. So that's where she gets Six Months, Three Days, Five Others. Anders is a truly master absurdist, and in this collection of stories, there's always more than meets the eye. In the first story, it's called The Fermi Paradox is Our Business Model. 
aliens reveal the terrible truth about how humans were created with an unexpected twist. The story will really make you wonder why we haven't discovered aliens yet. The second story is called As Good as New, and in this story, a woman comes across a genie in a bottle and gets three wishes after the end of the world. This unique telling of a traditional three wishes story explores what a human might wish for if one of the options was saving the world. Into State is the next story, and this one is about a family reunion in which some attendees aren't quite human anymore, but they're still family. Does your family argue over body parts? Because my family sometimes does. <laughs> and this story uh, is really mostly about family and what family means. In the next story, The Cartography of Sudden Death, someone from the future tries to solve a problem with time travel and ends up with two problems. Trying to fix time travel is real hard, y'all. And this story really goes into that. The next story is Six Months, Three Days, which is the title story, and it's a story of the love affair between a man who can see the one true foreordained future and a woman who can see all possible futures. They're both right, and that makes for a really interesting relationship. This story won the 2012 Hugo Award for Best Novelette. It is the best story in the book. If you don't read any other story in the book, read Six Months, Three Days. It's so, so good, and it will really change the way that you view relationships and the future. And finally, the last story in the book is called Clover. It was exclusively written for this collection, and it's a coda to all the birds in the sky, which answers the burning question of what happened to Patricia's cat, which is something that I've wondered since reading All the Birds in the Sky. As I said, that was my favorite book of 2017. If you read it, you'll discover Patricia, who is one of the main characters in the book, and her cat, and things that happen to her cat who kind of just disappears at one point in the book. And then you're like, what happened to the cat? Well, this story tells you what happened to the cat. It's a great story. I really highly recommend this whole short story collection. I like short story collections because you can easily pick it up, read a story, put it down. You don't have to read the stories in order. You don't even have to read all the stories. You can pick and choose the ones that, you know, really appeal to you the most. I'm really excited about Charlie Jane Anders coming onto the novel writing scene. She's been writing short stories for a long time. I'm excited about her as an author, and I'm really, really excited to see what she does next. Next month in our Book of the Month segment, I'll be discussing Fledgling by Octavia Butler, who is a science fiction legend. I highly recommend with starting with her with either Kindred or the Xenogenesis series. Both of those are great places to start. If you've already read some Butler, please read Fledgling with me. I'll be discussing it next month. I've been really interested in seeing how Butler portrays vampires. So I'm really excited to discuss Fledgling with you next month. So join me in reading Fledgling. If you haven't read Octavia Butler yet, though, I really recommend reading either Kindred or the Xenogenesis series first. So as I said earlier in the podcast, it has been Mardi Gras season in New Orleans. And even though I'm a big old grump about it, of course, obviously, many people enjoy it. Uh, so for this month's interview segment, I'd like to welcome Bill Lofelm, author of the Maureen Coughlin series, the newest book being The Devil's Muse, which takes place in New Orleans during the Muse's Mardi Gras parade. Bill is the critically acclaimed author of seven novels, and he grew up in Brooklyn and Staten Island, New York. He moved to New Orleans in 1997, and here he has taught high school and college, worked in an antique shop, and done absolutely everything there is to do in the bar and restaurant business except cook. He received his M.A. from the University of New Orleans in 2005, and in true New Orleans artist fashion, he plays drums in a rock and roll band. <laughs> Bill lives in the Garden District with his wife, A.C. Lambeth. Welcome, Bill. Hey, Candace. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. So how do you feel about Mardi Gras? Your book is set at Mardi Gras. Do you like it? I, I do. I, I like Mardi Gras. I, this Mardi Gras was really mellow. Yeah. Uh, we didn't do a whole lot. I only went to a couple of parades, Muses, of course, uh, and then uh, Orpheus. And we went out, you know, down the quarter yesterday. But I'm one of those people, I'm always happy when it's here, and I'm happy when it's over. It, yes. it lasts, <laughs> like, just whenever it, whenever it is, it lasts just long enough. I'm like, okay, it's fine. Right. That it's over this morning. <laughs> yeah, there's uh, I, early in the podcast, I was talking about how there's a big parade in Dimian that passes right in front of the bookstore. Um, and so I always have to deal with that parade. But I'm not a crowds person, which is why. And I grew up here, I guess. So I'm just sort of over 
doing it. I I've guess. been I don't to, know. I've been to twenty something Mardi Gras now. Yeah. And so so yeah. Kind of. I, I feel like it goes in waves. You know, you're really into it for a little while, and then maybe you kind of mellow out a little bit, and then maybe you get back into it as time goes on. This is true. I, I would agree with that because there have definitely been times where I've been like super into it. And then it's like, nah, yeah, me too. This year I'm going to go on vacation. <laughs> yeah, I have friends in Belize and they kept posting oh, pictures nice. and I was like, man, that looks good. So, so jealous of that, too. So tell us about the Maureen Coughlin series and the new and the Devil's Muse, the newest book. Well, the Maureen Coughlin series as a whole is about a young woman who decides to become a police officer. And because of some things that happened in New York where she grew up, um, has to leave. And so she decides, this is set um, about five years after the storm. She realizes that New Orleans is recruiting heavily to, the, to rebuild the police force. And so she decides that, you know, she could kind of fast track her career by, by coming to New Orleans and becoming a, a cop here in the city. And uh, so the series really has turned out to be her rookie year. It's her first year on the street. And, of mm-hmm. course, that culminates then with um, her working her first Mardi Gras. Mm-hmm. And so The Devil's Muse is the story of her being stationed on the route uh, during muses, the couple of other cops uh, on the uptown part of the route. And then there's a shooting just off the route that she's got to contend with. Um, basically, in, in the literal sense and in the metaphorical sense, stop the bleeding yes. before things get worse. Yes. And um, and so why did you choose to write crime fiction versus other things you could have written? When I was starting out, I, I knew I was good at dialogue. I was good at character development. I was always worried that I was kind of weak in plot. Mm-hmm. And crime fiction kind of lends it, you know, lends itself to you drop a body. There you go. You have, right. a, you have a plot. <laughs> you know? So I just felt that that was good for me. And a lot of the things I like to write about um, lends itself to the, the crime fiction world. I think. You know, crime fiction has really become the the locus of the social novel. And there's a lot of social commentary now on the novel, which I also like to write about. You know, I don't like mm-hmm. the, the soapbox to squeak too loud when, right? I, when I get up on it. <laughs> but, you know, I like to talk about, you know, more than who done it and, and why did it happen and what are you going to do about it and, and the, the place that it happens. You mm-hmm. know, all the books that are set in New York and the books that are set here are very location driven. You know, I feel like the location is a character and crime fiction is very location driven. A lot of the most famous series are, are rooted in one place. You know, Laura Lippman's Baltimore and Dennis Lehane's Boston, Michael mm-hmm. Connolly's Los Angeles, so mm-hmm. James Lee Burke's South Louisiana. You know, he was a big inspiration for me. So those are some of the reasons. Yeah. And I think New Orleans especially lends itself to being a character <laughs> as a location because it's such a, a unique and different City, especially with Mardi Gras. I mean, that's a character in and of itself. It is. One, one of the challenges, well, one of the challenges about writing a series set in New Orleans and about Mardi Gras especially is translating it for people who have not been here and don't know the details and don't live here and, yeah. and don't understand right off the bat when you say it's on the uptown lakeside corner of such and such <laughs> right. or, you know, or what the, how the parade route functions. And, and so to try and explain all that, you know, it was, was a real, without the whole book being exposition about Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras. Right. <laughs> yeah, and actually trying to have a plot and character development and some humor and, and, and that kind of stuff. So it was, was a real it challenge. And was that you, like, knew already? Did you have to do any research about Mardi Gras? Like, how was that for the I did, pr- how um, parade routes work and stuff? I did a bunch of research into how the police handle it, mm-hmm. um, most of which was a long interview uh, with a, a veteran officer who was nice enough to, to sit down with me. And we have like a two and a half hour conversation about what it's like to work the route. Um, Cause I always felt like one of the things people who don't come here and aren't from here don't understand about Mardi Gras is um, the parade route and how family oriented the parade route can be mm-hmm. and really how family oriented Mardi Gras mm-hmm. can be, you know, so that was one of the things I wanted to talk about. So that was one of the reasons I said it, you know, where I did and it, it it takes place over about four hours during the Muses Parade, um, and everything happens kind of between like Louisiana and you know, Calliope or Calio. Okay. Uh-huh. So, so yeah. it's kind of you know contained in that in that box. So, uh, so the thing I really researched was what it's like to be an officer on that part of the route. 
I thought that was a really interesting conversation. It was really <laughs> fascinating, and it's it's an experiment in physics. It was like the closest thing I could find. It's all about pressure. Mm. And, you know, the police go out on the route, and they seem to kind of watch for when the pressure builds, and they release it. That makes sense, I guess. And you can yeah. see, yeah, and you can see... And of course, after it's explained to you, you, I would walk up to the route. This, I had this conversation before Mardi Gras two years ago and walk up to the route and I would watch the police officers watch the crowd and you could, I could see what I was told put into practice. You uh -huh. know, there's a couple group group of kids from different schools or whatever. Somebody's talking to somebody's girlfriend or whatever and, you know, guys start to bow up and it starts to get a little tense and, you know, here come three officers and they just walk through, you know, and everything diffuses, uh -huh. you know, for another hour and then... They walk back, walk back an hour yeah. later. <laughs> and it's really, you know, it, it's really smart. It, it achieves the desired effect, which is keeping everybody cool. And nobody's putting their hands on one another. You know, nobody's getting dragged off to jail. Right. And, you know, so it was really kind of fascinating to watch it happen. And, and that the science thing was the only way I could really. Yeah, that is really think interesting. Of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so let's talk about teaching for a minute because you've taught creative writing at a lot of different places. You've taught at the library and at the Greater New Orleans Writing Project and at UNO, I believe. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and the Mystery Writers of America and lots of different places. So do you like teaching and do you think that teaching helps at all with your writing? Teaching. I do. I, I, I like it a lot. Um, yeah, I'm happy to be doing it at your store. It's kind of my, my first you know, this is my second set of self-starting classes uh, uh -huh. that I'm doing with you. But I've I've done master classes and and lectures and presentations for festivals and and writers groups and book clubs and and I do I really like it. I mean, I was a teacher, I was an English teacher for a long time right out of college, mm -hmm. um, and I was ready to move on by the time I was done, you know, teaching high school. But I did I enjoyed a lot of it, you know, and that that back and forth between people and just helping people find their voice and, and, and their story and the, and encouraging people. It's, and, and I think especially having gone to UNO, you know, and my wife was in the MFA program, mm -hmm. so I know a lot of people from there. And so ever since I started UNO, I've had a writing community. I mm -hmm. have friends who are writers. And so there's, there are always people to talk shop with uh, and to complain with and talk about what it's like trying to be a creative person and, and a lot of other people don't have that. Mm -hmm. So to be able to create an environment where people just get to talk shop and be around other writers is really important to me. That was such a big thing. My writing career, I guess, really started when I was in high school and I went to these Saturday morning workshops at the local library. Mm -hmm. And it was my first experience with having a writing community. And I like being able to help people find that. Yeah, I think that's important as well. Writing is such a solitary thing um, when but, when you're writing yourself, so you kind of need to. Well, solitude talk to is people. good, but isolation is bad. Yeah. So trying to strike that balance. Yes. Is is really a challenge. Yes, and um, and Bill is actually teaching a writing workshop at Tub and Coos at the bookstore. Like we said, it starts February twenty fifth. Um, and they'll be on Sundays. It's three Sundays, correct? Yes, three cons <laughs> three consecutive Sundays. Okay, and so uh, and it is called strengthening your writing. Is that correct? Strengthen strengthening your, your story. Story. That's what it is. <laughs> strengthening <laughs> your story. Writing workshop. That's where I was getting that from. Um, and so there'll be three classes. One is character. One is setting. Setting and. The structure and pacing. Structure and pacing. So if you're interested in being a writer, definitely come on out to this class because, or if you're already a writer and you just want to strengthen what you're writing, it's good for people at any level? It is. It's okay. specifically designed for people at any level. It's really good for pre and post workshop, like before you start writing something and after you've written something and you're looking to make it better. Mm -hmm. this, these classes are kind of both for, okay. for both of those tasks. Okay, great. And also, signed copies of Bill's books are available at the bookstore, Tubby and Coos Mid-City Bookshop. And you can take Bill's, the first of Bill's upcoming writing workshops, like I said, Saturday, Sunday, February 25th from 2 to 4 p.m. And more information about Bill's book workshops and books can be found on our website, too, www.tubbyandcoos.com. And Bill, where can people find you online? Uh, I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and uh, Tumblr. Tumblr, yes. And we do have links to all of this 
on our website as well if you go and check that out. So thanks for being with us, Bill. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Candice. (laughs) And that's all the time we have for this month. Join me again next month for more book industry news, great science fiction and fantasy books written by women of color, my book of the month discussion of Fledgling by Octavia Butler, and more. You can find a recap of this month's podcast, including links, book reviews, book lists, and more at www.tubbyandcoos.com slash blog. You can also find the bookstore on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Tubby and Coos, spelled out. Tweet us what you're reading because I would love to discuss with you. And you can visit our website for upcoming events, book recommendations, book club reads, and more. Thank you for listening to Novel Ideas on WRBH. I'm your host, Candace Huber. Keep on reading.